and I'm going to introduce Sally, who will be speaking to us today. Sally is a senior lecturer here at Massey University in the School of Humanities. She's a PhD in Asian Studies from Auckland. Yes. And has worked as a postdoc and has had a postdoc fellowship at the National University of Singapore. Um, and your research interests are in uh, the area of migration and transnationalism, especially Chinese migrants. And um, Sally has published extensively on the topic, including most recently a monograph, um, Chinese Transnational Migration in the Age of Global Modernity, the Case of Oceania. And she's currently working on a three-year research project on transnational migration, uh, especially on new Chinese migrants in New Zealand and their multi-generational families. And um, she'll be presenting today on family immigration policy and flows in contemporary New Zealand. And over to you. Yes. Share the screen. Okay, you should be able to see that now. Can, can you see that? I think so. You guys can see the PowerPoint? Yeah, okay. Oh, well, so I'm starting. Good morning, everyone. And I guess I don't need to introduce myself again. <laughs> <laughs> well, so today I'm going to talking about uh, family immigration policy and the uh, flows in contemporary New Zealand. So this talk, I actually, I will do um, material from mainly from uh, my master project on multi-generational new Chinese families in New Zealand, as well as I will do material from my very recent interest, uh, the research interest in family immigration policy and the flow in New Zealand. So I will do those two parts and to put the materials together to talk about family immigration policy and the flow in New Zealand. I'm focused on the uh, um, recent uh, immigration policy and the recent salario. And so first the question come to my mind, why studying family immigration uh, in New Zealand? So from my point of view, so unlike the economic immigration, so when we see economic, uh, immigration, so it's uh, include the skilled and the business immigration. Well, so this stream of uh, immigration has been constantly treated as the priority um, in research, as well as uh, in any immigrant immigrant receiving country, because um, of the um, potential economic contribution the skilled and uh, business migrants can make for the immigrant receiving countries. And then we can see the literature, the academic literature, and uh, there is a less literature about the family immigration compared with the skilled and the business uh, immigration. Um, so family immigration normally has been treated as a secondary um, form of uh, immigration and been treated as a financial as a financial burden and the dream of a social resource of the host society because some of the dependent family members um, they intend to have a higher rate of a social benefit uptaking and also the um, health health cost. Um, however, I have to point it out that to studying family immigration is really important in migration studying. Firstly, is because family reunification and the support is a very important mechanism for new migrants in a new society to adapt to the new environment. So family can help them and to help them to overcome obstacles and the difficulties of integrating into the new society. And the second reason to study family immigration is because family immigration actually contributes a lot to the can influence the a country's immigrant population 
profile and the overall trend of the immigration flow. So that's why I'm studying family immigration. So why should we turn this one? Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> Okay, um, so this this talk I divided this talk into three parts, and so the first part I will draw material from academic literature on immigration policy, as well as the government immigration uh, immigration policy reviews and the text. So I will provide a brave outline of uh, New Zealand changing immigration policy related to the entry of migrants family members. So um, through this policy analysis, um, uh, I will show you how the idea of neoliberalism influenced immigration policy evolution and uh, craft the policy changes in New Zealand. Um, the second part of this talk and, uh, is a statistic analysis. Uh, I will use the recent decision data from Immigration New Zealand uh, to show everybody and the significance of family immigration. And usually in the New Zealand case, when we say family immigration, we're actually we're talking about the family sponsorship immigration, which means family members came to New Zealand first and after they settled and uh, they sponsor the family members to immigrate to New Zealand later. <laughs> so this statistic analysis will focus on the top 10 immigrant um, group of New Zealand. Um, the last part of this um, presentation, I will mainly uh, focus on my master project of uh, new Chinese migrant uh, transnational families in New Zealand. And uh, this is a case study. And I use this one and to show everybody to reveal the impact of family immigration policy change on New Zealand second largest immigrant group which is a new Chinese migrant from the mainland of China. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. I will do the next one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, we move on to our first part. So it's the immigration policy analysis. Is it here, yeah. right? Um, no, no, left. 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 Yeah. Oh. Okay. I just stop here. I don't want to move, don't want to move that one. Okay. Um, so it's um, well known that New Zealand embarked on an uh, open door immigration policy uh, since 1987 after a major immigration review being done in 1986. Um, so um, this open door immigration policy, many of the academic literature comment on this, uh, the, the New Zealand embarking on this open door immigration policies, this new immigration policy has a very clear economic agenda. So I, I, I won't uh, get uh, into too much detail on that, but also this open door immigration policy value um, family immigration. So this can be evidenced in immigration policy review. As I show you and in some quotation here. So first one is from the uh, immigration policy review 1986. So it just said that the new immigration policy also aims to strengthen families and the communities. Um, so the value of the family immigration also can be seen through some academic literature as some prominent immigration scholar in New Zealand and returning and he comment on this um, new open door immigration policy is with respect to aged parent, adult children and uh, um, siblings. Move on to 1992, 
and followed the um, 1987 Immigrant Act. Um, a point-based system was introduced in New Zealand. So many of this system uh, uh, um, aims to um, secure the human capital for New Zealand. But at the meantime, uh, a family category was formally introduced the first time. And so the family category at that time in, in the new immigration policy in 1992 included three situations. So um, marriage, de facto, and they put all of those immediate uh, um, family members together as the third category is parents, dependent children, single adult children, and uh, siblings. So here, um, it's very clear that um, from the very beginning that New Zealand embarked on an uh, open door immigration policy. So immediately family members, so including their spouse, partners, dependent children, adult children, um, parents, siblings, were all defined to be included into the family immigration policy. So in my paper I'm drafting now, I argued that this was actually quite a social liberal compared with many other uh, immigrant receiving countries because um, uh, some of the uh, immigrant receiving countries, they only define um, family members, they only include the family members, the nuclear family members, spouse, dependent children, to be included into their country's immigration policy. So New Zealand did actually better than many of others. Um, this one, right? Um, okay. <coughs> yes. So move on um, to sound one and the situation uh, would change. So in 2001, um, New Zealand immigration program was uh, officially launched and uh, a managed entry regime was introduced. Uh, so under the New Zealand immigration program, um, there are three um, immigration uh, um, streams. So one is the skilled business stream. And so this stream we can be say and uh, we can considering immigrants from this stream are economic migrants. So they have the ability to make economic contribution to the society. And the second stream is a family sponsorship stream. And the third is international humanitarian streams. Okay. Um, so what this um, managed entry regime is about is actually this regime set up a planning range of quota for recent approval on an annual basis. So it also regulates that the share of the total recent approval under each immigration stream. Uh, for example, the skilled and the business stream and uh, uh, they have been uh, uh, given 60, about 16% of the share of the total resident approval. So you can see, and uh, the stream and uh, received uh, the uh, large percentage um, of the share of the total resident approval. And uh, then is the family sponsorship stream is uh, given 30% quota of the total residence approval and followed by the international and the humanitarian stream. It's about seven and eight percent. Okay. So we can see that so this valid entry regime um, signals a clear shift of New Zealand immigration policy orientation from social liberal, in my paper I argue, from social liberal to new liberal, which giving the focus on economic output from immigration, but overlook the immigrants, the skilled and the business immigrants of personal and the family needs. Um, move on. 
to 2007, um, the neoliberal pursuit of the immigration policy change regarding to the entry of immigrant family members can be further evidenced in the policy change in 2007. So in 2007, the policy change uh, it was quite um, significant. So in the review of the family sponsorship stream, our review policy review, this is the quote, um, the Minister of Immigration recommend, this is the quote here. So it is said, while the family stream perform an important social role, it is critical that policies also be considered through our economic lens. So this review finally made a critical change in policy related to the family immigration stream. So firstly, in 2007, New Zealand family immigration stream was divided into two substream. So one is uh, for the nuclear family members, partner and the dependent children stream. And under this substream, there are two categories. And then the second stream is for the immediately family members, including parent, adult children, and the siblings. So adult children and the sibling was put into one category, and the parent category uh, was the individual one. So, um, the second change of 2007, in 2007, um, is it's very significant, is especially within this um, family um, immigration stream. And all of those subcategories, like parent category, adult children, and the sibling category was capped, uh, was a fixed quota, the number. What the cap means is when the cap, the number, the quota was reached, for example, the quota for the parent resident approval is about 4,000 per year. When it's reached 4,000, so the immigration in New Zealand wouldn't um, uh, accept any more applications under this kind of uh, category. So, however, we need to be noticed that the only is the parent and adult children and sibling category were kept, but the spouse and the dependent children category was not kept. So, what does this mean? Okay. So this means that actually, uh, immigration New Zealand made a deliberate attempt to prioritize the entry of a nuclear family members, especially the partner and the dependent children, while they want to limit the entry of other immediate family members. So who are more perhaps more dependent and vulnerable and have relatively no workforce participation and higher tendency of welfare cost. Yeah. Um, in addition, um, in 2007, another um, significant change of the family sponsorship stream is uh, our enforcement of a minimum income threshold for sponsors. So this is the first time they started to regulate the sponsors they need to have this amount of salary per year. So people who can demonstrate they have this amount of salary, they can sponsor their family members, otherwise they cannot. Uh, and then there is another one, is an increased length of time of the sponsor would have to support their parent without access to the benefit system from two years before and to five years. So within the first five years, when the migrant parent in New Zealand, they cannot access any kind of social benefit, uh, benefit of one. Uh, using it. Um, no, no, you left one, left, left. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
move to 2012, actually more recently. <laughs> The economic lens to construct a family sponsorship immigration was further, adva was, uh, further ad advanced in 2002 when a two-tier selection system was introduced to the parent category and uh, adult and sibling um, category. Okay? Um, just the one year before 2012, the new policy um, came out um, there is a paper and a recommended paper for the Cabinet Domestic Policy Committee. So the Minister of uh, Immigration State, I'm quoting here, and it is said, parent sponsored by high contribution sponsor or who bring a guaranteed income or fund will have a high priority for New Zealand residents they will also have more flexible eligibility criteria and reduced um, processing times. So, so under this uh, um, two-tier selection system, um, people applicant need to um, need to submit the UI like the skilled um, category the expression of interest before the um, uh, UI was, uh, before the Immigration New Zealand invited them to launch a formal um, application. And also their submission of uh, uh, UI must be submitted with reference to a division of a two-tier entry um, criteria. So as you can see here, I'm showing you the, the following slide. What's this two tier about? So application under tier one. So the sponsor, if the sponsor can provide a higher income threshold and uh, the application can be assessed in a much faster pace. Yeah. So this is the amount of the income requirement for application under tier one. Yeah. But under tier two, the, fi the financial threshold requirement is much lower than the income requirement under tier one, but the assessing time, the waiting time is much longer. So officially at uh, seven years, which is uh, unreason unreasonably um, long. Um, Apart from the the um, the change, the enforcement of the um, two tier system, there are some other changes in the two thousand and twelve immigration policy change. One is under tier one, and the center of gravity principle was removed, which means that. Uh, uh, if um, people um, are more familiar with the New Zealand immigration policy, this principle, center of gravity principle, will ha have been enforced by uh, for a very long time um, for sponsoring the um, family members to come to New Zealand, which means that the sponsor, the ap the applicant has have to demonstrate. <coughs> Their center, their family center, and the focus is on New Zealand. If the family have one more child, so they have to demonstrate there is. Uh, let's see, the family have three children, and they have demonstrated two children are living in New Zealand. And so, if it, it is the case, they can sponsor their parent to come. Okay, but for tier one, because uh, you you demonstrate you have a higher income, so you don't need to meet the center of gravity principle. However, application on the tier two, and still need to meet this um, criteria. So it's quite different. You can see. Okay. Um, so in a paper. In a paper I co-authored with another academic a few um, years ago, so we argued, this is a quote, for the first time in the history of New Zealand family sponsorship immigration policy, income, wealth, 
of parent and all their adult sponsor has become the defining selection criteria. This policy clearly reflects the shift towards a stronger economic focus on the cost and the benefit of uh, immigration policy strain. Yeah. A, very, a very recent change is in 2006 about um, the um, family immigration stream, especially the parent category. So perhaps it's because um, the new, the two-tier system did, did, did not work very well. And perhaps another um, practical reason is because um, there are too many caseload in immigration New Zealand, the parent application. So they have to stop uh, close off the parent category and not accept uh, any more application under this category. So from 2006. So, so it's completely stopped. And whether this category will reopen or not, it depends on a policy review after two years, actually it's this year. <laughs> um, the policy review I think now is uh, underway and uh, the result outcome will out very soon. So we'll see whether uh, the parent category will be reopened or not. If it is, it uh, will be reopened. So the parent category under the family uh, will go back to the two tier system like I mentioned. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. um, um, uh, another thing I want, I want to mention here um, is the 2006 policy change actually serves the actual goals of the uh, overall immigration policy change goals, which are provided in the 2015 immigration policy review because during the past three years, and uh, New Zealand has experienced a uh, uh, high peak of uh, immigrant intake. So immigration New Zealand and aims to reduce of the total number of migrant intake from the range of 19,000 to 100,000 over two years to 85,000 and 95,000, okay? And it's also specific, specifically targeted the capped family category. They want to reduce the quota given to the capped family category from 5,500 per year to 2,000 per year. So it's quite a significant um, reduction. So I think this is a part two. So I'm just wondering any questions so far. I'm open for questions or disturb me in the middle mm -hmm. if you have any questions to ask. So if there is no questions, urgent questions, I will move on to part two. No, it's not. Okay. <laughs> So we move to part two. Part two is a statistic analysis. Okay? I want to use this statistic analysis to show everybody the significance of family sponsorship immigration in New Zealand. The data I'm using, like I said before, is from the, is the recent decision data, R1 data, um, from Immigration New Zealand. Um, so this table, shows the approval for residents by nationality and by migrant stream and category from 1997 to 2016. So that's the only data I can get, to, I can trace back uh, from 1997, not uh, any early anymore. <laughs> and uh, I pick up the top 10 uh, immigrant um, source countries of New Zealand, so which include four Asian countries, China, Indian, um, South Korea, and the Philippines. Uh, it includes also three Pacific countries, Fiji, Samoa, and Tonga, and three English-speaking countries, which is uh, Great Britain, South Africa, 
and the USA. Okay. And so you can see the data well, is grouped into three um, immigration um, stream, family stream, skilled business stream, and international and humanitarian stream. And within each stream, there is uh, the present approval under each category uh, was were calculated, and the percentage uh, were calculated as uh, well. Um, so to help everybody to uh, see the analysis result in a more visualized way. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, so based on the table I show you, here comes to a figure. So the figure <coughs> is actually based on the table I, I made. So um, you can see, um, so uh, all of those columns here at the very right is the uh, um, total resident approval for the top 10 countries. And the other column on the, um, from left side to here uh, is the resident approval um, data by 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 immigration category for each countries China India South Korea and so on and uh, so forth so we can see of course Great Britain uh, is the largest is the first largest immigrant um, source country for New Zealand followed by China and India and so on and South Africa so on and so forth and the Philippines now is quite substantial uh, as well so the column here for each country I'm just uh, taking China as an example and the first column is the total recent approval for China and of those the other column was different kind of presenting the recent approval approval under each immigration category. So the rate is the sponsor, the grain is parents, and then as a sibling and the skill and the business. Okay. So what kind of key messages we can take we can take from the speaker. So first overall so if we are looking at the total resident approval number for the top 10 um, countries. So this is the total number for the recent appro appro mm -hmm. approval top 10. So the blue one shows the recent approval on the skilled category. So we can see the skilled category is a major channel for New Zealand immigrant intake, okay? Followed by followed by the sponsor and the parent, so on and so forth. And if we compare all of those top 10 countries, still we can see recent approval under the skilled category is a major, is consistently major um, channel for immigrant intake across all the uh, countries. Um, however, um, we can see that the family, the recent approval on the family stream, if we end spawns, parent, sibling, and adult together, so recent approval for the family under the family immigration um, stream was uh, is quite uh, substantial as well. So it's about 33%. I didn't show the um, percentage here, but it's in my notes. That 33% of the recent approval was actually under the family immigration stream. And this percentage, 33%, is literally in my was New Zealand. Um, the entry management regime, the, the manage the entry regime, which regulate the resident approval under the family immigration should comprise about 32 to 33 percent of the total resident approval. So it's in night. Okay. Um, 
However, we can see from this figure there is a great variation which exists in other categories by nationality. Um, for example, because my master project is uh, focused on the new Chinese migrants from China, so I always take in China as an <laughs> example. For example, China, apart from the um, skilled um, category, is a main channel for the Chinese to come to New Zealand. The recent approval under the parent category was actually higher than the recent approval under the response, which is in many other countries, the other two, two, not other, not other, uh, another four top countries. Usually the usual case is the recent approval under the response is much higher than the recent approval under the parent category. So my question here is, <laughs> because in China, China is the only country of the top 10 country. The, um, its recent approval under the parent category is higher than the recent approval under the sponsor category. So does that mean Chinese prioritize their parents rather than their partners, are parents more important than their partners? So this is a question. And uh, I'm still thinking about the way um, in which we should interpret um, the data. Um, move on. I want to show, I want to invite you to look at um, China more. So this figure shows the China share of the total recent approval of the top 10 countries by immigration category, same time period of time. So within the total recent approval for top 10 countries, China, if we are looking at the business category, China contributes more than 50% of the total recent approval under business category. So this is, of course, uh, uh, reflect the, um, the nowadays, the booming economy in China, which really back up the Chinese migrants' financial ability to enter into New Zealand as uh, business migrants. And uh, very distinctively, um, for, Chine for, for, for Chinese immigrants, okay, and the China contribute about 40% of the total recent approval for top 10 countries. 40%, it's quite significant, right? But uh, comparatively, and for skilled um, migrant, China actually uh, um, contribute less than some other um, countries, okay? Um, Drawing all of those tables and from the figures I show you, and there are three key points I want to discuss. So firstly, I want to see from the data I show you, and we can see the force of immigration on the family sponsorship stream in New Zealand is quite um, strong. So family immigration is actually ranked as the second major path for New Zealand immigration inflow. Um, secondly, we can see some major variation between countries in the share of the total recent approval on the different immigration categories. Mm -hmm. For example, compared with three Pacific and the two Asian countries, China and India, and the Great Britain and the South Africa, two English speaking countries actually contribute to much less in the immigrant intake under the family sponsorship stream. But those two countries, Great Britain and South Africa, made quite a substantial contribution to the skilled migrant intake of New Zealand. Okay. Um, lastly, the last point I want to discuss is 
such a ph ph phenomenon actually reflects the family unification as an important cultural value and practice for some Asian and Pacific countries. And this cultural value can be found in the immigration scenery. So this is the second part of my um, talk. Move on to the um, section three of my presentation. Um, this presentation is based on my master um, research project. I will particularly this project particularly looking at the policy change, uh, the changing policy um, of New Zealand immigration policy, uh, its impact on new Chinese migrant family from mainland of China. Okay? So, so far, this project will finish the pilot interview. Uh, so today, my, my, my talk about this case study is based on 11 inter pilot interviews and I have done. So here is a profile of the uh, interviewees so far. So this project, looking at the multi-generational family, so including the first generation parent immigrant, we call that first generation. We also interview their children, so we call that grandchildren generation. We also interview um, the older generation, so we call grandparent generation. So among now, so far, we interviewed 11 in total, and here is a profile, so I guess it's really easy to understand. I don't need to uh, um, discuss the um, profile of the participant in detail. So now it's covered three generations. So now I just want to show you some quotations. So it's a still um, preliminary, okay? I want to show you some quotations from the interview I have done. So I will leave one minute or maybe half a minute to everybody to read through. Either I'm just uh, comment on the quotations in the uh, next slide. Just the last two slides. <laughs> okay, I guess uh, everybody finished reading the quotation. I just uh, move to the next slides. Is my discussion point based on the interview I did? So, what things we can find um, from the interview? Firstly, <clears throat> uh, we can. We can see a highly interdependent family relation um, drawing from those interviews. And uh, this highly interdependent family relation um, is, uh, uh, has been reflected on, the, on their family arrangement of new Chinese migrant. Okay? Um, for example, um, If the parent generation, the first generation, have a very close relationship and somehow they are highly dependent on their older parents, so whether the parent can come to New Zealand or not come to New Zealand have the huge implications uh, of their further um, migratory trajectory. Okay. So the family relation is quite uh, interdependent. The family members intend to help each other, especially we found that the grandparent generation um, provide substantial support to their adult children in terms of uh, um, child care for their grandchildren. Um, the second key finding is we found the failure piety as one of the important contribution value 
um, within the new Chinese migrant family plays a key role in influence migrant family members um, migratory trajectory. As the quotation you show you and also during the interview, our interview is frequently see that if I cannot bring my parents to New Zealand and uh, they will go back to China or find other options um, to settle um, their aging parent. Uh, especially in the China case because uh, before 2015, China has the one-child policy, so a lot of Chinese migrant family, and uh, they have uh, the, the first generation adult migrant is actually the uh, old child within the family. So when their parent is getting older, so they are they're trying to follow that failure duty, and so how to take care of their older parent is their uh, um, moral um, responsibility, actually. Um, the third um, key point I want to make is the current New Zealand immigration policy, especially the policy um, related to, to the immigrant family members, is um, a hurdle for new Chinese migrant family to adapt the new environment. So this hurdle actually can influence New Zealand to sustain and retain um, their unskilled and business immigration inflow. So if the grandparent, the older parent cannot come to here, so many of them will think about to leave this country. Okay, that's a problem. The last point I want uh, to, point, uh, to, to, to discuss, it's uh, uh, perhaps is so far is uh, the most important finding um, we were from the master project. So uh, we call that um, seasonal grandparenting. So what's that mean? Okay, so it's uh, changing. We explain <laughs> we explain that as a changing transnational habitats. So what's that mean? So transnational habitats when in, in, in the existing um, um, literature of transnational migration, so much emphasis was given to the first generation migrant. And I see this generation of migrants, they have the hypermobility, they have transnational mobility. So they are quite mobile. So they are moving around country, going from one country to another country. Okay? So however, uh, uh, the Marston um, research project found that actually the parent generation, the older parent generation, the older generation, they are actually really, really mobile. But in our stereotype, we're always thinking about this generation uh, is much more immobile, but actually they are really mobile. So that's why we call that the seasonal grandparenting. And especially in the new Chinese migrant case, because of the Chinese culture and uh, um, uh, grandparents contribute a lot to, of taking care of the um, grandchildren. So when the grandparents, they are not able to come to New Zealand as a permanent resident to stay here and provide uh, um, child care, and, uh, but they know that they're adult children, the parents, they lead this kind of support. So they come back and forth between New Zealand and China and to, uh, to take care, to try to take care of their families, especially the grandchildren. So especially in the case now in New Zealand, and we have this uh, three-year grandparent or parent, a three-year parent, visiting visa. So three, within three years, they can come to New Zealand with multiple times. And uh, um, so that's uh, the mi migration and the, their tra 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 the traveling uh, um, method, um, the immigration category, the visa status, um, many of them they have. Yeah. Um, here, last thing I want to uh, mention is to study Chinese migrant family um, 
the Chinese migrant family is actually just one of many migrant families in New Zealand and who have, have been negatively influenced by New Zealand restrictive family immigration policy. So therefore, to study this particular migrant group has far-reaching uh, uh, implication theoretically um, because the contribution to the transnational migration study, as well as very important, have important implication to New Zealand future immigration policy making. Um, wrap up, I will be really quick wrap up this presentation. Um, the first part of my um, presentation um, demonstrate that a new liberal trend in New Zealand immigration policy formation. Yeah. So we can see previous policy uh, um, actually ensure certain skill of uh, family immigration, including um, migrant parents. However, this approach has gone through a fundamental change, and this fundamental change and this fundamental change reveals exactly what neoliberalism in immigration regime really mean. Okay, so that is really focused on the economic gain from immigrant, but overlook migrant personal and family need. Okay, and the central concern of having a new liberal immigration regime uh, is the fiscal cost on some dependent migrant family members, and to re to reach the uh, policy goal, so the financial threshold is enforced to the uh, um, applicant um, sponsors. So they, they use the financial threshold to define who are desired migrants and who are not. And the second conclusion remark, um, New Zealand and the immigration country, there is no doubt that the New Zealand need migrant. Okay? And so New Zealand has to accept a certain scale of migrant older family members in terms of sustaining and retaining skilled and business migrant. Um, last point, I also admit that uh, addressing physical challenge caused by older population in any immigrant in any immigrant receiving country with welfare provision uh, is quite important. We, we should address the problem. Okay, but this needs to be done through strong policy enforcement to fix up policy loopholes rather than cutting off one important immigration route. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sally. Um, that's a really interesting, really great presentation, really interesting topic really timely, but really interesting to see what comes out of the Marsden study and how it affects those three different generations. Um, going to open up for questions. I think if we just take off the... Control station back to you. <laughs> okay. Where do we have... Where's Orphan gone? <laughs> oh no, you're there. Any questions for Sally? What? Yeah, yeah, here we go. <laughs> so to speak. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering, Sally, if, um, yes, that was very interesting, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, in, in, it's kind of a slightly technical question related to policy, I guess. That is that um, you said uh, it would seem that Chinese uh, prioritize their parents over their spouses or their partners. But could it also be a possibility that a lot of Chinese are transitioning from student and, and work visas and so on into residency, and therefore they're not likely to have a partner outside the country. They're likely their spouse or partner is going to be inside New Zealand probably. Yes. Um, so that's you know, one, uh, one aspect. Or those who come uh, into New Zealand from China, let's say, um, they may they may come as uh, pairs, you know. They may come as skilled migrants, both both partners. Um, may, maybe more so than some other countries. I'm not sure. But I'm wondering if there's any kind of information that you have around that, those possibilities. 
um, well, I don't have uh, uh, actually uh, statistic data about that. Now, I haven't done that yet, but I know there is a possible way to do that, is to looking at the recent decession data, the R1 data in that pure table, if you can choose um, the uh, um, principal uh, applicant. If uh, I, I will run that later and to see whether I can identify how many applications, how many applications, um, well, how, how many people, how many Chinese, uh, they are coming to New Zealand as partners. So from the interview and also from the observation, um, it's what and uh, um, what you said is actually quite right. You're actually helping me to interpret my, <laughs> my data is a lot of uh, um, Ch new Chinese migrant families, they actually immigrated to New Zealand as a family unit. So the husband and the wife, they, they come to New Zealand together. Mm -hmm. So there is no need that the nature, they will uh, sponsor their partner or their wife or their husband to come to here because they are in the same application. It's just a principal applicant and a long principal applicant. But the husband and the wife, they, they are included into one application. So they come to New Zealand as a family already. So they don't need to apply for, uh, uh, to sponsor their uh, spouse, the wouldn't wife that, or husband. Come to wouldn't that still show up as family? Sorry? Wouldn't that still show up in the statistics as family if you came on the same application as the factory or as a spouse? Yeah, well, it, it, will, it will show in the pure butter cable, I'm quite sure, mm. because in the pure butter cable I'm currently run, there is, there is a category, I haven't had the time to run, there is a category you choose principal applicant mm. and a long principal applicant. I hope if I choose that option, some data and will come up and I can make a full story based on the uh, quantitative data. But from That's, uh, an important point though is that um, there is a partner category, right? And the partner yeah. usually comes at the same time, I presume. Um, but that's that's that partner is not in your sponsorship category, right? That's that's a separate yeah. category from the sponsorship. The sponsorship almost, as you said it. Yeah. So uh, they are actually so those uh, those partners actually is a part of the skilled immigration mm -hmm. application or business immigration oh, sure. application. So the sponsor is actually a quite a separate one from um, the uh, economic immigration mm -hmm. strain. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm just wondering—is that true? I think it's true. I'm wondering as well because I mean I came as a <laughs> de facto partner. Mm -hmm. so, and then my husband oh, me, I put his name as partner in the yeah. same application. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Mm. But it'd be worth clarifying where that what the, what the data is specifically. Yeah. Anyway. I, I've got, a, seeing as we're talking about data, I've got another data question. Um, <laughs> I don't usually ask data questions. Um, you mentioned about seasonal grandparenting and yeah. the, 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 the parent or grandparent visa, visitor visa. It, it, it seems to me that there should also be some interesting data on that. Um, so you seem to be talking from an anecdotal perspective or from the interviews themselves. Have you had a chance to look at the extent to which um, there, there is actually a, a lot of seasonal grandparenting going on? Because the data should tell us whether there's much of it. It might just be, I know people talk about it, but does it actually happen in short? Yeah, well, that's a good suggestion, Frances. So I think that's another way this Mustang um, research project can go even further and to looking away from the uh, recent data. So we can um, looking at the visitor base because a lot of uh, old Chinese parents, they come to New Zealand with the three year or actually the six months visitor visa. So I think that's uh, another way to full round uh, our um, project. Is that what you mean, right? Yeah, I guess so. You haven't had a chance to look at that yet, because I think it's quite. No, I haven't had the chance. I haven't had the chance to look at the quantitative one about the uh, seasonal um, grandparenting. But it's a good way to go for. Yeah, I, 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 I will do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Any other questions from anyone? Can I ask one more? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, was I, I can ask one more. Oh, no, go for it, yes, sir. Oh, I was just wondering, in terms of the mass and study and the sample, whether, because you're talking about new Chinese migrants, whether all of these migrants have arrived after, uh, say, the 2012? Oh, 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 okay, so they're not necessarily people who are, like, last five years or so. Oh, yes, that's the same so thing. There was a difference. It's always and, like, uh, that, uh, that's really a thing to, um, to can be um, arise, uh, generate the debate. When we see new Chinese migrants in New Zealand, they will, we wrap up all the Chinese came to New Zealand after the open door immigration policy in 1987. But actually, yes, there is a sub -debation. So within the new Chinese migrant group, for example, uh, uh, I guess uh, before 2002, and uh, those new Chinese migrants that come to here before 2002, they are a kind of a traditional, uh, um, very um, working very hard generation Chinese to come to New Zealand trying to uh, um, uh, establish themselves mm -hmm. through a hard way. Okay, and uh, after 2000. There is a, a new Chinese international student, and a large number of them came to New Zealand after 2000. The new millennium, and I am actually, I am actually that generation. Mm. And so this group of uh, students, Ch Chinese students, migrant, <coughs> they came to here to study, and after studying, and they uh, find the job and uh, establish themselves. So of course those. So this new generation, they, they came from a better off family back to China. And then we come to after 2016, this kind of thing, that new arrival, the most new mm. arrival is what we call that, the new rich list, right? And so they came to New Zealand with money and was the financial investment capital. So they came to here, very typical case, first week by car, second week by house. So. Yes, I admit that the uh, are sub division mm -hmm. of the new Chinese migrant group um, for the master project. Uh, it's a good way to think about that. If there is a sub division of a new Chinese mm -hmm. migrant group, if we did, if we done all those interviews and when we interpreted the data, and that might be a good way to go to think about to, to interpret the, 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 the data in, in, in such way if uh, the generation division contributed quite a lot to uh, um, their different uptaking of the migration mm. uh, trajectory. So that's a good way for, mm. yes, I would see. But uh, so far, so the Masson project uh, doesn't distinguish the okay. subcategories of new right. okay. Yeah, because I was interested in how people yeah. maybe, because <laughs> you're saying the policies obviously affect the migration trajectories, but also I'm guessing how they plan it, yeah. whether they're already aware of the policies yeah. when they come to the country or they've been here a while, were planning to bring their parents and now they have a chance to do that. Yeah. Mm. Any other questions? You have a question on chat, Jess. Oh, yes, we do. Thank you. <laughs> there we go. Hi, Sally. Oh, Thank I, you I for can. the very interesting topic and presenting such useful statistical data. <laughs> Excuse my lack of access. Okay, the question is, <laughs> in the qualitative part of your research, yeah. what are some of the emotions emerged from principal migrants in relation to family and intimacy? Mm. How has the lack of intimacy or the fulfillment of one's intimacy affected once migration yeah, well we definitely have uh, um, question. interview questions to address the um this questions we have we have a particular set uh, of uh, interview questions to to asking our participant about uh, um, what we call that uh, theoretically we call emotional transnationalism <laughs> so asking them how close they feel um, they are with their parents how close they feel they are with their um, grandparents and uh, how would you feel about your immigration 
process? Are you satisfied? Mm. Okay. I thought it was interesting, maybe just on that note, that you categorize the three generations as immigrants, grandparents, and grandchildren mm. rather than parents and children in relation to the immigrant. I think yes. that says something about yeah. the sort of conceptualization of yeah. relations yes. and what relations are important. Mm. Mm. Um, could, could I just follow up with another question, Sally? Yeah. Um, so your, your last slide, your last point on your last slide, you talked about having um, what sounded like stricter policy enforcement. And I wonder what you meant by that. So you seem to be suggesting that the parent category should be open, but there should be stricter policy enforcement. Um, because... Are you suggesting something in particular? And yeah. I wonder then what are the implications of that, because there are always unintended yeah. implications of... Yeah. yeah, I'm actually, I didn't bring that really clear here because I'm in a rush to finish. <laughs> but yes, I do have a specific things to suggest. So when I say um, New Zealand need a strong policy enforcement to, to fix up the loophole, the policy loophole, I'm actually particularly uh, refers to um, because the close off of the parent category and all of those change trying to progressively restrict the entry of immigrant uh, um, parent to come to New Zealand. One, one central concern is about those old people come to New Zealand and uh, they will um, put financial stress on New Zealand uh, social provision system and the health system. And so my point, what I'm suggesting is, so uh, um, in terms of uh, um, um, retain and sustain business and uh, unskilled migrant, we need to accept migrants or the parent to come to New Zealand. But to avoid some cases that the public system, the welfare provision system and the health provision system um, is being uh, abused in some case, occasionally, and uh, perhaps our New Zealand can develop certain very strong policy to enforce when the parent come to New Zealand and they need to buy the medical insurance mm. to ensure that. And uh, when they ca came to New Zealand and in the case they needed the medical support, they are actually sustained themselves or they sustained by their families or by their sponsors. So in that case, it perhaps can offload the financial burden I mentioned before. But whether this is fair, a lot of fear can be remained as de for debate. But if we want to address the policy loop loophole, and that perhaps is a way, rather than to just to see, okay, we close it off, and we reject all of those applications from this particular um, category. This is <laughs> I, I just wonder, so I mean, okay, we could have a debate about what, what's fair, but I mean, I guess two interesting points that come from that. One is that you could argue that that's bringing the neoliberalization of migration onshore. Mm -hmm. So your argument has been that, that the, the two-tier system and now the closure is a neoliberalization of the migration regime offshore, and I agree with you completely. Mm -hmm. but, but bringing a dual citizenship regime onshore where people have some rights and other people don't have those yes. rights, that's bringing that onshore. And I guess the, the, the question that might then come from that is, you know, what kind of, you know, what, how different is that from people having access to a three-year grandparenting visa that could, it's effectively people would be indefinitely on a non-status, you know, non-citizenship status within New Zealand. I mean, is there, are there risks that come with that? Mm -hmm. I can see how it appeals to the kind of the, the, the knee-jerk kind of reaction of the public. Yeah. Um, but does it potentially open up a whole set of other questions around perhaps intensifying the neoliberalization of the migration regime? So I guess there could be a huge debate about whether one solution 
is open reopen the parent category and with more restricted uh, um, uh, and regulation about uh, the medical insurance or whatever kind of insurance they need to buy, or there might be the other options like a longer visiting a visa with multiple entries. That might be another option. Do you think there is an option to actually just open <laughs> the no, parent no. category again? And you know, going back to Cunliffe's argument from 2006 that we need to consider the economic no, alongside the social to actually say so we need to consider the social yes, <laughs> alongside the it economic. Yes, it is. Actually, the 2016, when they closed off that parent category, and there is no submission and no uh, uh, consultation. And the union like um, um, Francis is doing with those uh, submission to the essential work visa, there is submission and there was connotation. But for the parent category, there was nothing. There was nothing to be consulted. It's just a decision is made and announced. And now, um, some the, from the New Zealand immigration website, <coughs> they have the oral announcement and said uh, they are doing this uh, um, policy review, uh, particularly was the parent uh, um, category. And uh, when I ask a lot of senior academic and uh, his estimation is if it has been a topic bring out by the immigration New Zealand, that perhaps will mean the parent category will be reopened for mm -hmm. certain period of the time. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> okay. Any other comments or questions? No? Okay. And maybe on that note, we can close the session. We will be hearing more about this project in November when uh, Jason has uh, some of his field work done. Yeah. <laughs> Some initial <laughs> results. No, next year. Next year, I think. But you're, oh, you're presenting in November then. Ah, huh? really? All right. Oh, okay, well, we'll have it. Okay. Let's have a chat. We might hear more. <laughs> um, for now, let me thank you, Sally. It was really interesting, really timely. Um, on topic next month in July, we're taking a break, and then on the 16th of August, we'll have Associate Professor Dr. Holly Thorpe from the University of Waikato who will be talking about um, the agency of youth in using particularly sports to enable migration. And she's particularly looking at youth in conflict zones in Afghanistan and uh, Gaza, so it'll be a really interesting topic. Yeah. Okay. Yes. okay, thanks everyone. Thank for you so coming. much for everyone coming. Yeah.